was this incredible outpouring of grief. It's like this human symphony. I, I'll never forget it. It'll be with me, it'll be with me to my grave. The sound of that. It's, it's all I can hear when I look at this picture. It was just awful. In early 2003, photojournalist Philip Blenkinsop made a tragic discovery in the middle of the jungle, stumbling upon the CIA's long-abandoned secret army in the Zizomboon special zone of Laos. We were the first white faces that these people had seen since they were abandoned by the Americans. Um, they thought that those days of living in fear and being on the run had, had finished. 12,000 veteran fighters. Their women and children had been clashing with Laotian communist troops for the last 30 years. Now, they want out. That all we want in Laos is peace, not war. As far as American manpower in Laos is concerned, there are none there at the present time on a combat basis. Laos is the most intensely bombed country in the history of air war. I honestly believe that we're trying to free people. We came from the sky and destroyed everything they owned, everything they loved, everything they held dear. became the progenitor for warfare in the 21st century. You want to know how wars are going to be fought in the rest of the 21st century? Look back at Laos. From 1960 to 1975, the CIA ran a clandestine sideshow to the Vietnam War in Laos. Long Cheng, a remote Laotian valley, became the agency's headquarters and the world's busiest airport, but was never marked on any map. Long Cheng was a very secret base and nobody knew about it. Nobody. Uh, now I don't even believe Congress knew about it at the time. More than 400 flights a day took off from Long Cheng, and the secret war grew into the largest operation in CIA history. For nearly 20 years, the Lao People's Democratic Republic isolated itself from the outside world after the war. All these years, the mountainous country kept its secrets. Laos is the only landlocked country in Southeast Asia. Due to its strategic location, Laos was used as a pawn in the strategic games between neighboring states, and more recently, between world powers. More bombs were dropped on the plain of jars in northern Laos than anywhere else on Earth. Before the war, some 50,000 people lived here. Many of them were members of the Hmong people, an ethnic hill tribe. According to ancient local legend, these jars were created by a race of giants who used them to brew rice wine for the celebration of an arduous but victorious battle. Decampment. The trail of the secret war leads into the Zaisambun special zone. Inside the zone lies the former CIA airbase of Long Cheng. This is our destination. We head now to Sai Sambun, uh, the space zone. Why they call it space zone? Because it means like the government have to take care special because they have problems. 
with the unorganized terrorism or a rubber attack the road and also the government put a lot of armies around many army camp you know I don't know them but I know their boss Susat Patrasi is a well-connected man and will take us into Long Chain. No outsiders have managed to reach the secret base since the end of the war in 1975. We pass the checkpoint unsearched. In the area, the scars of war are visible everywhere. Cluster bomb casings are used to support houses. Entire villages are built from war scrap. ago, Fred Brantman came to Laos as a humanitarian aid worker. Today, he returns to the place that changed his life forever, Tat Luang Pagoda. When I uh, pulled up to the pagoda, I would say I was just a kind of careless adventurer. Uh, no particular goal in life. I went into that pagoda, I, I talked to those people, and one hour later, I was a completely different person than the fellow who had entered the pagoda. And there were thousands of refugees just living like animals on the floor. And I walked up to the first one and we started talking. And he mentioned that he'd been bombed. I, I wouldn't have even thought to ask him. And I remember that I was in complete shock. Oh my God, I never heard of this and I'm living in Laos. Uh, and I realized that no one else outside of Laos had heard of this. There had been secret bombing going on for five years that had killed thousands of people, driven whole populations on the ground, and no one even knew about it. because I didn't have a, a moral framework, a conceptual framework into which this fit. Yeah, I, you know, you, you read about something like this, you know the terrible things happen in the world, but when you're seeing it with your own eyes, and it's people that you like, people that you don't want to see them die, uh, there's an element of almost craziness that, that starts to arise, you know? This is the only eyewitness account of the massacres, the mass murder of civilians that occurred on the plain of Jars as a result of the air war. Without these drawings, there would be no record uh, other than, uh, of course, the testimony of the people, but it's, it's these drawings and the essays they wrote to accompany them that, that tells us what it was like to live under an air war, what it was like to see your beloved grandmother burned alive before your eyes. The stories of the refugees touched a nerve in Brantman, and he wanted to learn more about the secret bombing campaign. With his Lao friend Nung, he rode out to this refugee camp almost every day. Thirty years later, the camp has turned into a village, and most of the former refugees still live here. It's a relative of his wife. Mm. Uh -huh. she'll, she'll tell some stuff. Oh, Sabaydi. Uh, Chelsea Young. Come. Come. Place of Puvieng. Chow Chuk Lava. I interviewed over 2,000 people in both northern and southern Laos 
uh, from the Plain of Jars, from the Ho Chi Minh Trail area, and from other parts, and every single one told the same story. สมัยนั้นสงครามที่ตอนเฮายูนเวลานักกันอย่างน้อยอายุมงศึกษาสิบสี่ปีเนาะแล้วถ้าว่าจะไปในขันยินเสี่ยงเขาเคสมันเป็
the security of all Southeast Asia will be endangered if Laos loses its neutral independence. Its own safety runs with the safety of us all, in real neutrality observed by all. Publicly, Kennedy agreed with Khrushchev that Laos should not become a theater of war. In Geneva, Laos was declared neutral once again. In 1962, a coalition government of all three political parties was formed and the U.S. withdrew its military advisors. Kennedy, however, wasn't playing fair. With the help of a falsified map, he played up the communist threat marked red. The Allied troops of the U.S. marked blue were not displayed on Kennedy's map. This enabled him to station 5,000 troops in neighboring Thailand. In the meantime, the U.S. president had given a green light to covert operations in Laos. The secret war had begun. At the American Enterprise Institute, a Republican think tank, we meet James Lilly. Lilly was U.S. ambassador to China and South Korea and started his career with the CIA in Laos. I was a uh, senior at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, and uh, I was approached by a professor taken to his, off his, his office, which was a very fine paneled office and it was lights were low and bookshelves and pipe smoking tweeds oh god damn hello yeah he said you had a background in uh, russian studies and that's our major concentration you have been a, an athlete a captain of a team which shows that you have some leadership You've been in the Air Force uh, Reserve Officers Training Program, which shows that you are interested in military affairs. Uh, you were born in China. You're, you're the kind of guy that CIA wants. Vint Lawrence was also recruited by the CIA directly out of college. They snuck the 22-year-old into Laos in 1962, just as the Americans were officially in the process of pulling out. My first impression was that I was extremely lucky. It was, it was exotic. It was all that a young man who had some cloudy images of what the Far East was like should be. It was hot. The women were beautiful. You know, I was, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. So what we were trying to do was find a big open valley where we could get aircraft in and out of and that was accessible. And Long Chen, at that point, when I first get there, I think I'm one of the first people who go there. It was a beautiful valley full of high grasses, karst formations, and a half a dozen people. And that's where we started. finally found these hill people, Hmong, that disliked the Vietnamese intensely, that lived in the hills. And we found that these people would fight, he'd be trained, organized under Vang Pao, who looked like he was a leader. He's a former sergeant in the French army. He had charisma. He was a fighter. A couple of case officers discovered him. And uh, they were looking very much for a strong Southeast Asian ally. never forget the first time I met VP. They were dragging a defector down toward him. As he walked by, he just pulled out his gun, blew the guy's head off, and kept on walking. And I said, I have to walk, listen to what this guy has to say. 
the Americans were tolerant of Fang Pao's brutal methods. They needed an ally. Today, Fang Pao is the Hmong leader of 250,000 expatriates living in the USA. His followers affectionately call him the General. Democracy. The Hmong mercenaries were trained in Longcheng by one of Thailand's elite military units. We were using ties. There were just so many ties you could use as a surrogate for bringing in a lot of Americans. That had great value. It allowed the American effort to work with a very small footprint. The Thai soldiers at the side of Vint Lawrence looked like Laotians, which helped the CIA to circumvent the Geneva Accords. Most Hmong had never seen welded metal, let alone planes. Their medieval culture was about to clash with the space age head on. Before they knew how to drive, they learned to fly. At that point, we were still on the right side of the angels. I thought we were doing the right thing with the right people in the right place. After just a few weeks of training, General Vang Pao and his Hmong soldiers set off to drive the Patat Lao off the plain of Jars. American involvement in the war was kept confidential. Officially, the Americans were conducting a humanitarian aid mission in Laos. Headquarters of the aid mission was a village called Sam Tong. Here, USAID had built a hospital that was featured in many media reports. The seriously sick and wounded come to Sam Tong, a Sansuk hospital. It replaced the old dispensary, which had bamboo walls and a dirt floor. There are 100 beds and often twice that many patients. The logistics of the aid mission were assigned to a private company, Air America. The pilots were Americans. Originally we were led to believe that we would be hauling rice and things for USAID, which we did. Uh, we had two or three different customers and we were told depending upon where you're sent, they would tell you which customer you would be working for. It uh, didn't take a mental giant, though, to, after you were there about a week to figure out that this wasn't just hauling refugees. Charlie Weitz flew for private contractors all over the world. He joined Air America right after his military service. You know, when I was 24, 25, I was looking for adventure. Here I was, a Marine, a pilot, you know, and that was before Vietnam started. And I said, you know, I want to do something with this. I'm tired of the war games. I mean, let's get into it real. And we did. <laughs> Air America was one of the world's largest commercial airlines with services all over the Orient. For USAID's civic action program, hundreds of landing strips, so-called Lima sites, were carved out of the mountain. In no time, the US had created the perfect infrastructure to wage war under the pretense of development aid. The extensive network of 400 airstrips made even the most remote parts of the Laotian rainforest readily accessible.
I'm not too sure, quite frankly, in the early days, just who actually knew the whole picture. It was sort of like a need to know to get the job done. Some guys might have gone up and they might have worked for a USAID customer for their first two or three tours and never got to call hard rice, which was ammunition, or troops. Only at the end of the war did it become apparent that the CIA actually owned the airline. And it was the CIA that really ran this entire operation. Their field agents had the relations with the Hmong elders. Uh, they'd worked out the arrangement with Vang Pao. Uh, it was their airline, Air America, that owned most of the agile aircraft flying in the mountains, bringing in supplies, extracting recruits for about a 30,000-man militia, a 30,000-man secret army. It was actually called the Army Clandestine. CIA case officers closely supervised the counterinsurgency offensives and tested a new strategy to batter the communist Patat Lao. The CIA's guerrilla army was fighting with air support. Bombers piloted by Hmong soldiers were called in from Longcheng. Not only is this a new way of fighting a war and using air power in a way that's never been used before in human history to take and hold ground almost independent of any ground force. ทำลายแล้วแปลว่าเมิดเชียงขวางเลยมันบ่มีเฮือนหลังนึงอีซีฟ้าเมิดเฮือนประชาชนเมิดอยู่เชียงขวางอยู่ปวงเชียงขวาง
Sai Sambun is the provincial capital of the military zone. No outsiders are allowed here. Government soldiers patrol the area. Nobody wants to talk on camera about the conflict with the remaining Hmong resistance forces. Sai Sambun is the gateway to Long Cheng, which lies a few miles further into the jungle. Vientian, the capital of Laos, was nowhere near the battlefields, but America's influence on the country's politics became more and more evident. Laos first does not have an economy. What we did is we subsidized them. And you can see that this can become a license for corruption. And it did. By 1964, the USA had pumped $545 million of foreign aid into Laos. Never before had America invested so much money abroad in a similar project. And it was all done in the name of democracy. If this sounds familiar, we wrote constitutions for them. We got them to have elections for their National Assembly. We tried to get them to elect their, their officials. And they went through this process. But it didn't, they didn't really take to democracy. So you have a real problem. You, and, and you cannot impose the democracy on the country, as we tried to do in Laos, a constitution and an election. Iraq, a constitution, an election. In 1964, four years into the CIA's secret military efforts in Laos, President Lyndon Johnson used fake intelligence to order military attacks against North Vietnam. Against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. We wish to emphasize we seek no wider war. In 1965, the U.S. introduced combat troops into Vietnam. With the world's attention focused on this expanding conflict, the CIA's war next door in Laos remained low-key. The Vietnam War starts turning the gears of the American war machine in Laos. More than 400 flights a day come into Long Cheng. The secret base became the country's second largest city. More and more soldiers arrived with their families in tow, and more CIA case officers and pilots stayed overnight on their missions up country. Yet, the entire city remained classified. Long Cheng was given the code name Lima Site 20 Alternate, seemingly an auxiliary landing strip to Sam Tong. Outsiders were to assume that the site was reserved for emergency landings. This meant that the CIA, away from the public gaze, had a free hand, and the secret agents in Long Cheng could go about their business undisturbed. It, it attracted odd people, wonderful odd people. So there was a mystique about it. The atmosphere surrounding the secret war was bizarre. In Laos, nothing was as it seemed. Secret agents in a private airline were fighting a covert war with a hill tribe army that did not officially exist. Laos's neutrality had become a farce. Men like Air America's country manager Dave Hickler were living it up in Laos. As the war in Vietnam escalated, one major purpose of the operation was now to interrupt the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the supply network of jungle roads and trails built by the North Vietnamese that led through southern parts of Laos. More and more bombing missions were flown to interdict the trail. There they are. We're 
Okay, I have my clear to fire. Right on, that's both of those. Look at that thing throw pieces off. What, what, a, what a burner. That's a large explosion. Yeah, let's see if we can find some more trucks here instead of one fireworks. Despite sustained attacks, the traffic on the trail never slowed. As the war in Vietnam developed, Laos became an absolutely critical battleground, particularly that 100-mile stretch between San Nua, the Plain of Jars, and Vinh Chan, that, that little tiny bit of territory was absolutely strategic, critical, if the United States were going to have a chance to win the Vietnam War. South of the Plain of Jars, the CIA's army in Long Cheng blocked the communists from advancing towards the capital city of Vientiane. The front kept shifting back and forth, and four years into the war, no one had made headway. In the meantime, President Johnson entered into peace talks with the North Vietnamese. The United States had stopped the bombing of North Vietnam in the area where 90% of the people lived. After President Johnson stopped bombing North Vietnam in May 1968, the air war over Laos escalated to new levels. The Americans sent ever more bombers, and the North Vietnamese provided additional support to the Patet Lao. In 70 and 71, there were reports coming back from South Vietnam about U.S. troops starting to use substantial quantities of heroin. And that's what brought me to Laos, was I was on the heroin trail. At that time, more than 30% of American soldiers serving in South Vietnam were addicted to drugs. There were more heroin addicts in the armed forces than in the whole of the United States. In the Golden Triangle of Laos, Burma, and Thailand, the most powerful men had long been opium dealers. These warlords were ideal recruits for the CIA. Opium was central to the success of the entire CIA-covered operation. Why? Because the CIA worked through a single leader, a single broker. All of its connections to the Hmong people went through Vang Pao. And Vang Pao's control over these scattered households across the ridges and mountains of northern Laos was made possible by the fact that he controlled the air power out of Long Chang, the rice into the villages and the opium out of the villages. Alfred McCoy went to a Hmong village aligned to Vang Pao's secret army and learned of a gruesome deal when he talked to the village headman. The local headman, uh, a man named Gersu Yang, he said, we did a bargain with the CIA. We gave them our men, and all we asked is for them to feed us. Now, Bang Pao and his men have asked us for the 14-year-olds. If we send the 14-year-olds, who will be the, the men to marry the daughters of the village and produce the next generation of children? We'll die uh, as a community. So we said no, and they cut off the rice. But only a few villages could afford to refuse Bang Pao's demands. For the majority of mountain dwellers, there was no way to shield their children from being drafted into the CIA's army. As a result, there weren't enough people left to farm rice. Opium emerged as the only viable source of income. The Air America helicopters would fly in. Hmong officers, lieutenants and captains in the CIA secret army would get off pay them cash for the opium, load the opium in the helicopters, and it would fly off to in the direction of Long Chang. Uh, I'm sure it had happened. I mean, nobody denies the possibility, but that wasn't what we did. There were certain alliances made in certain areas that within Laos, you would move this guy's marijuana from here to there, but uh, that was as far as it went with us, and that was condoned, I would say. 
After he learned about the secret bombing campaign, Fred Branfman became obsessed with trying to stop it. He started to work with journalists to expose U.S. atrocities committed in Laos. Probably my sanity was saved by working with these journalists and feeling I was doing something. You know, that every day I could get up trying, you know, I could try to find another journalist, I could interview some of the people, send their photos to the Kennedy subcommittee, and I could do something. And I think that probably was one of the things that saved my sanity at that time. Mr. Bramfman spoke of those refugees whom he has interviewed. In 1971, Fred Bramfman appeared before a U.S. Senate subcommittee on refugees and spoke out against U.S. officials in charge of the secret bombing. I challenge that, uh, that, that, that statement. What I'm trying to suggest, sir, is that there is a good deal of evidence to suggest that the United States has been carrying out the most protracted bombing of civilian targets in history. As far as the media was concerned, Branfman's efforts were mostly ignored. While the world's first televised war was taking place in Vietnam, off-screen, the U.S. Air Force was bombing Laos every eight minutes. As the veterans returned home, the conflict spilled onto American streets and the tide of public opinion was turned against the Vietnam War. However, Laos veterans were forced to stay silent as the executive branch continued to keep Congress in the dark. Whilst in Vietnam, war correspondents went to the front. Reporters who met at the constellation in the Laotian capital stayed put and hardly ever challenged the official line of U.S. policy. I was quite shocked, particularly with two particularly well-known journalists. One is Ted Koppel, who later went on to be the chief correspondent on Nightline, and Bernard Kalb, who at the time was a very important correspondent for CBS. I worked for both of them. I took them both out to the refugee camps. They knew that Henry Kissinger had ordered bombing raids that had murdered thousands of innocent people in violation of the Nuremberg Tribunal. Bernard Kalb wrote a biography of Kissinger. You look in the index, there's nothing about Laos, even though he knew that Kissinger had ordered these horrible bombing raids in Laos. Why? Because they were pursuing their careers. It wasn't until 1971 that three journalists finally made it to Longcheng and uncovered the secret base. After nine years of operating in secret, Long Cheng had been exposed. Still, the war in Laos didn't make front page news. Even though it became known there was a Long Chain, uh, the policy continued and it did not make a big difference, as far as I can tell, on the course of the war or anything else. The war had gained its own momentum, and in 1971, Long Cheng was attacked by the North Vietnamese and Pathet Lao forces. New CIA case officers, such as Eli Chavez, were assigned to mobilize their remaining mercenary forces. Chavez filmed his own troops as they marched into battle. I sent them out, and we received a lot of casualties within four, I mean, uh, five to ten minutes. We lost 40 men at that time, killed and, uh, and wounded. And so uh, there was an anger from the Lao commander, and he says, you Americans like to fight the war 25 meters away. I was very scared. During the charge, uh, my mom and dad were, uh, used to, they taught me an old Spanish hymn, Mas Allá del Sol, and I, I sung that, that song all the way when I was charging the, the hill. During the take back of Skyline Ridge, we lost 900 people killed, missing in action, and also wounded in action. And that totaled out to almost uh, three battalions that we lost. And that was all within a, a week and a half to almost two weeks time. After 11 years of war, all Hmong men of fighting age were dead. And so, 
the CIA sent thousands of children into battle. You see, not enjoying because he want to study and he want to know more, but the pressure push him to soldier. By now, after years of bombing, the plane of jars had ceased to exist. But the biggest bombing in history was yet to come. And what the plane of jars and what it's a symbol of is how those people on the vague frontiers, those people in the third world, those people we never see and never know about and never hear, can be vaporized, wiped off the face of the earth without people back here even knowing about it. And then they would, they would fly these B-52s in, in what they considered carpet bombing, arc light strikes. The B-52 strikes are one kilometer wide and three kilometers long. But the arc lights were so high and a precision bomb, nobody could hear them. What had started as an air-supported guerrilla war had escalated into an all-out air war. Although the B-52 proved to be the wrong weapon to attack soldiers in the jungle, the war machine continued inexorably. For a period of nine years, the U.S. Air Force conducted airstrikes every eight minutes. Any sign of life in enemy area is considered military targets. When it gets down to people, in Laos, whatever move was shot at, was bombed, was naped. It was more than 10 air, uh, arc lights that I called in. I was sitting on the TACAN pad, looking into the valley, and suddenly, the whole valley just exploded. It must have been terrifying to anybody that survived it. I mean, the whole, whole valley. And I want to credit the agency, I want to credit all the, the case officers and the, the staffs, everybody. It was a great, great organization and, and I, I'm, I'm very proud of it. Uh, for my efforts there, I received the Intelligence Star for Valor. And, uh, and uh, the citation is just wonderful. It makes me want to cry. The secret war in Laos was the largest air war in human history. The United States dropped more bombs on Laos than it did on Germany and Japan combined during World War II. If the United States is guilty of war crimes, in Vietnam, systemic war crimes, where we violate the laws of war as an act of policy by commanders, okay? That war crime was the bombing of northern Laos. We destroyed a civilization. We destroyed a small medieval civilization, the Lao Fung civilization, surrounding the Plain of Jars. We wiped it off the face of the planet. We drove tens of thousands of people into becoming refugees. We inflicted we don't know how many dead. There's no counting, all right? We, we incinerated, we atomized human remains in this air war, okay? And, and what, what happened in the end? We lost. I've never done this with my own parents. That we're speaking to them. The question of how we do these things is very important. We often intervene in these places and our leaders stir up our emotions by making the case that we should do it. Uh, and we don't think enough about how we're going to do it. And it's the how that's important, not the rights and wrongs. 
At the end of our trip, we reach Longcheng. It's clear that the village has sunk back into oblivion. A few Lao troops are stationed here in what looks like a ghost town. In the next future, we will have a new road, access to Siangkuang province. It also means that we open Longcheng Excesses, which is tourism attraction in the next future. Wang Pao's house is sealed off, and the old CIA compounds lie in ruins. From here, the American vision of a free world brought only death and destruction. Today, Longcheng is a stark reminder of the failure of this vision. In May 1975, two weeks after the end of the Vietnam War, the Patet Lao won, and the CIA evacuated Longcheng. They took 3,000 Hmong with them. Thousands more were left behind to fend for themselves. Now, more than 30 years later, these forgotten people finally get their chance for peace. Why is your son in Iraq? I've asked him that before. Ooh. I asked my son, why are you going? I owed lots of people, Daddy, a lot of money. And, uh, and I can pay my bills that way. That's what he's doing. That's basically what I did. Thank you.